Are you looking for wisdom, courage, and guidance on your journey as a change maker? Grab your headphones, a warm drink, and possibly a notebook. You're going to want to take notes. You found your new favorite podcast. Welcome to Become a Good Ancestor, a podcast hosted by Layla Saad. Layla is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author, an international speaker, and a globally respected teacher on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change. In each episode, Layla interviews some of the world's most inspiring authors of color who are changing the world with their words. From memoirs to manifestos, poetry to pop culture, science to social justice, and everything in between. Join Layla as she dives deep with BIPOC authors who are showing us the way to healing and liberation. This is a place for people who want to help change the world, in honor of those who have come before us, and in service to those who will come after we are gone. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Become a Good Ancestor. We're here for episode three, and I'm your host, Leila Saad, and I'm ready to dive into what I'm sure is going to be another amazing conversation with another author of color. Um, And this month, I'm extra excited because we're reading a fiction book. Today, I'm speaking with the author, the one and only Lola Akinmade Okostrom. Lola is an award-winning visual storyteller and international best-selling author and a travel entrepreneur. She has dispatched from over 70 countries and her work has been featured in National Geographic, New York Times, The Guardian, BBC, CNN, Travel Channel, Lonely Planet, Forbes, and many, many, many more. In 2018, she was recognized as one of the most influential people of African descent in media and culture. Her book, Due North, received the Lowell Thomas Gold Award for Best Travel Book, and she is also the author of the international bestseller La Gomme, although I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, Um, and it's about the Swedish secret of living well, which is available in 18 foreign language editions. Her debut fiction book, which we'll be talking about today, is called In Every Mirror, She's Black, and it's published by Sourcebooks Landmark, and it's our June 2022 book selection in the Become a Good Ancestor book club. To find out more about the book and to join us in the book club, please visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club. So welcome to the podcast, Lola. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited to be having you. Um, This is actually our first fiction book of the year. We've read two nonfiction books so far. And so it was good to like switch up the pace and have a different kind of book. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And it is... I don't want to give any spoilers, but I'm just like, I finished reading the book and I messaged the team on our Slack and I was like, have you, you know, have you read the book? And it's like, I immediately wanted to talk to somebody about it the moment that we were finished. Um, So I feel very privileged that I get to actually speak with you, the author, about it today. Um, So before we dive in, Lola, um, where can people find you and your work online? Absolutely. Um, I'm quite active on social media, so it's at Lola Akimade. You can find me on all the major uh, social media channels, as well as the book as its own account. So the book's account is at In Every Mirror, and you can find that on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter. Excellent. How was my Swedish pronunciation of your other book? Is it Logom? <laughs> I'm sure Logom. it's not. Logom. Yeah, logo. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Close enough. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. Um, so I ask every guest the same question to kick off our conversation. And the question is this, who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned, societal or familial, who have influenced you on your journey? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, the first person that comes to mind is actually my maternal grandmother. Uh, Mm -hmm. because I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and she was one of the first examples of what it was to be a strong woman standing in her power. And so she was very, you know, for for the time, she was just 
kind of vibrant, uh, had a, a very strong voice, could not be controlled or quote unquote tamed by society. And so she showed me kind of what it was to be a woman living on her own terms, right? Living, mm. laughing, loving on her own terms. And then just uh, more ancestors living now. Uh, you know, there's so many. I mean, I, I count opera as one of them, right? Because she's somebody that stands in her power as authentically as you can and, you know, uses your a voice. And I am a visual storyteller that yeah. uses ve- many different platforms, you know, to tell stories. So there's so many ancestors, but uh, past will be my grandmother just for who she was and uh, what she represented. And of course, living will be a uh, opera. I love that. I love that so much. Um, so you alluded to the fact that you were born in Nigeria. Um, and I know you were yes. educated in the United States and you're currently based in Sweden. And so when I when I read that about you, I actually felt an immediate affinity to you because, you know, mm. <laughs> I similarly have this, uh, you know, very varied background. I was born in Wales, grew up in Wales and Tanzania and England, and I live in Doha in the Middle East, and my yes. heritage <laughs> is is East African and uh, Middle Eastern. So immediately mm. I was like, I feel like I would get along with this person, you know, <laughs> you <laughs> yes, had all of these different varied yes. experiences, you know, you, yes. you feel that. And, and one thing I, I did want to say is, you know, and that's where you kind of build your own super culture, right? Because then yes. you take the best of all the different cultures you've lived in, you've grown up in, you know, I've taken the best of Nigeria, the best of the US, the best of Sweden to kind of create my own values and reality and the way I want to kind of raise my children, you know, create my own quote unquote super culture. Yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. It it kind of um it reminds me of how, you know, growing up my dad who were is a mariner, so he's always worked at sea um all his life. And so he traveled around the world, you know. Um and he he always told us like if anybody asked me where I'm from, like I just say I'm a citizen of the world. And he was very adamant, yes. you know, he's very proud of his culture, but he was also very adamant not to be boxed in or to be stereotyped in any way, or to be limited in any way as well. Um, and so I, that Absolutely. when you said super culture and kind of defining for <laughs> ourselves who we are, I love that uh, so much. Yes, yes. I'm sure one of the questions you get asked a lot, Lola, is like, where are you from, but where are you really from? Um, yes. so- <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know? and, and it's one of those things I always say is, okay, where is home? Because, you know, I've got mm. my home on three different continents. But I say, you know what, home is actually a space where yes. I can exist without a- actually explaining my existence in that space. Right. So yeah. that's what I define as home. So it doesn't have to be tied to a country. It could actually just be tied to a community. Is this a space I can just fully show up as myself without actually explaining my existence? Then that feels like home to me. You know, and so home can be in specific parts, you know, of the country in different communities. What um draw what draws you or where do you find you feel the most sense of home or community or belonging? What do those spaces look like or feel like for you? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, Nigeria feels like a almost like a life source because I grew up there. You know, it's a place where I can always go back and just kind of fit in and not have to explain what I'm doing in that space. You know, in the U.S., I had different communities. I was a, a rugby player for many years. And so the wow. rugby community there, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> yes. And, you know, and just the communities that are tied to my interest where I can again show up without explaining that that felt like home. And then in Sweden, I found amazing communities of black women, you know, women of color thriving, you know, uh, trying to carve their own space and mm. and use their voices here in Sweden. So that, again, feels like home, you know. So, yeah, it's lots of different elements in each part, <laughs> in nature, place I've lived. A, a huge part of who you are is, like you said, you're a visual storyteller. Um, it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, you're a highly talented um, and respected photographer, and you're also a very accomplished writer in both 
nonfiction and now fiction as well. So storytelling is like it's what you're it's what you're here to do, right? Um, yes. Yes. What drew you to, or I guess, what was? Tell us about your journey as a storyteller. What, what, where those uh, early seeds of it began and how it blossomed over time. Absolutely. So sometimes I always say that the source of your creative voice can actually be tied to a source of pain, right? A mm. source of pain. And so when I moved uh, from Nigeria to the U.S. at 15, I moved into a, a new culture with new rules that had already defined my narrative for me as a Black woman, right? I was moving right. from Nigeria with my own belonging, with my own identity. And so I struggled to find belonging to, to what, what was my identity in this new space, right? And so I was isolated a lot, right? And we usually tend to isolate what we do not understand. We exclude what we do not understand. Right. Just hum yes. basic human nature. So a lot yes. of my creative voice came from that isolation. It says, you know what? How can I foster cultural understanding? How can I write stories that make us understand each other better? Because once we understand each other better, then we isolate each other less. We exclude right. each other less. And so that's kind of where my creative voice as a writer came. And it's the same voice that actually translates into photography when I photograph people. You know, I try to capture that moment of connection so that you see them. You mm. fully see them without judging them based on their on their background or the environment. So yeah. I love that. Did you begin f where where that sort of where you were starting to tap into that? Did it begin first with photography or was it writing or was it just an exploration of many different things? It actually started with writing first. And mm. it actually started with fiction. So oh, when I how was, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind yeah. of going back to my first love, right? This book is yeah. going back to my first love, which had always been fiction. I grew up writing, and especially as a teenager, I spent many years writing lots of short stories, filled up books, and was actually running my own library in my dorm room. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that people were checking <laughs> in. At, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So people are checking in and it. out my stories. They had a sign out shit. But wow. then I, you know, I got into, you know, nonfiction, travel writing, but I always wanted to come back to fiction and realized that trying to rewrite some of those stories I wrote as a child with an adult voice was challenging until I realized I hadn't lived then, right? I, right. I hadn't experienced like yet. So I wasn't reconnecting to the stories. And so uh, this book was the book I was meant to write at this stage of my life. Oh, wow. Based on all the experiences I've had up, up till this point. That's incredible. I, first of all, as a library nerd, um, I love that you were like, <laughs> I'm going to set up my own library and write my, my own, own books <laughs> and have my own system yes. and you can check books in and you can check books out. Yes. I love that yeah. so much. What were those What were those early stories about? What were the kind of topics that you were writing about oh at goodness. that time? There were, there were just stories of like, I would flip through magazines, pick up yeah. Uh, cut out two pictures of people and say, you know what? I'm going to write a story about this guy and this, you know, uh, fell in love with this lady and all, you know, just as a teenager writing lots of, I think stories that were maybe even more mature for my time. Right. <laughs> than I should have been right. writing. But they were actually a, br but they were actually quite a broad range of stories, you know, the, uh, but most of it covered relationships and trying to kind of connect with each other or trying to understand, you know, each other. So a lot of that I already could tell in those stories I wrote back then. And w did you have, I can imagine like, did you have like avid readers who were like, what, what happens next? Like, I want to know, give us another one. <laughs> When's the yes. next one coming out? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. They were, all, you know, they were all my classmates, right? They were all my classmates, uh -huh. my, my colleagues, and all the books were handwritten. You know, so they yeah, were just wow. notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks, and and I and I think it's great because now you know I keep in touch with all those uh, classmates, and they can vouch, yes. and they're like, "Oh, remember this, or remember this yeah. story, or remember." <laughs> so it's so it's it's really uh, it's really humbling, you know, and uh, and I'm grateful. <laughs>
That's fantastic. Um, how did you get into photography then? Yes. So photography was actually a means to an end because I used to be an oil painter. And when I traveled, I used to take photos of the places I wanted to paint when I got back. So oil painting was actually my main thing. I actually had a company where I was selling my oil paintings with a friend who was a photographer. You know, so that was what I was thinking I was going to do a lot of oil painting. <laughs> but then uh, when I, after a while, I was like, I feel like I'm duplicating effort. Like <laughs> the photos <laughs> look fine. <laughs> yeah, the photos seem to look fine on their own, right? <laughs> so, so I started, uh, you know, using photography and exploring photography as a new medium, you know, for expression. Yeah. And so that's mm. kind of how I got into photography. And then it really complemented the travel writing because sometimes they always say sometimes a photo, you know, you take a photo and you don't need to write. Yes. Right. Sometimes you actually have to write because yes. the photo doesn't do the writing justice, you know? So, yes. so it really depends. And that's why I feel really fortunate to be able to switch mediums based on the story I'm trying to tell. Because mm. sometimes just writing and evoking a sense of place through words can be even stronger than just taking the photo of the place, you know, and, right. and vice versa. So, so that's yeah. kind of how I got into the to photography. This context is so helpful to have because I think, and we're going to talk about your book next, but it's this like very multi, ver it's, it's a book that has several different characters with coming from very different backgrounds. And even like the side characters are all yes. having like very unique backgrounds and very unique storylines as well. Um, but I, I'd like to just, just ask you about your travel writing and um, how, like what, what kind of things that you write about there? So the stories that are accompanying the photos, what is it that you're trying to get across? It seems like connection and relationships is a huge recurring theme. Yes, no, absolutely. And, and for me, a culture drives a lot of what I do. I grew up in Nigeria, mm. which has over five, uh, 250 different tribes speaking over 500 different dialects. Like it's very yeah, multicultural. Wow. And for you to it's be a able world, to- It's a world unto itself. Pretty much, pretty much, right? Yeah. And for you to be able to thrive and live side by side every day and respect each other, which we do, you know, especially yeah. growing up in Lagos, it means trying to understand different cultures, you know? And yes. so- when I travel, that's, for me, that's the biggest part of travel is what makes us different? What makes us similar? Why are we different? What, what, what are some of those uh, nuances I can understand? You know, that, okay, mm. if I understand this nuance, then it gets me deeper, you know, into the mindset of the culture. Yeah. And so a lot of my travel writing has to do with that. You know, I, I love food, but I love more kind of traditional, slow gastronomy food that has history, why, <laughs> you know, uh, different lifestyles, whether it's fishermen, you know, or, you know, the fishing lifestyle or artisans that create and craft with their hands. Um, so mm. those are traditions, people preserving traditions. So those are the themes I love to um, experience and write about in my travel writing. And that ties into all the work I do, even my nonfiction book, Logum. It really is about the mm. Swedish culture and getting venated, right. you know, in a nuanced way. So, so that's what uh, ties all my work together. Culture. That's fantastic. That makes so much sense because as I was reading mm. these characters <laughs> who are very different, I was like, she managed to capture what felt like a very, um, what felt like a very authentic representation of of being in those coming from those specific cultures and like the nuances and the differences. Um, so I think your entire background, both your personal, but also your work background allows you, I think, to be able to tell the story in that way. So we've been talking about the book. Let's talk, let's tell people what it's called. We've, we've told them it's called, um, in every mirror, she's black. What is the book about and what is the title? Because I the title is what immediately made me want to like know what is this book about? Um, so what does the title mean to you and what is the book about? So the title really is about no matter where you go, no matter where I go as a black woman, that's what the world sees first. Um, I'm met with all the stereotypes the world has crafted on my behalf, 
the narratives the world has crafted on my behalf. And then based on the interactions with me, people start to deduct from the stereotypes. Mm. And that is such a burden for Black women to, to carry. And so the point of the title is to say, regardless of Kemi's background or Britney's background or Muna's background, the first thing you see yeah. right away is, is just the color of their skin. I just, yeah, just their blackness. Yeah. But as you yeah. read the book, you can see that all three women have really nothing in common. Very different yeah. values. They are individuals. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's the point of the book is to show kind of this multi-dimensionality to black mm. womanhood. You mm-hmm. know, that even though we face some of very similar issues, we're also individuals. And we yeah. need the privilege to be treated as individuals. So that when I make right. a mistake, they don't, you know, they don't say, well, you know, you know, that's how all black women are. Because then they're like, no, but yes. I know Layla, she's not going to make the same mistake. She's different. Right. So, and that's right. the privilege of individuality. And so that was the point of the book is to create three very different women. One that represents class, culture, and career navigating a predominantly white space, Sweden. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so set us up. So how, when someone asks you, what's the book about? What is the like very brief synops- synopsis that you give them? So, so the book really is about, you know, three different black women. One is a marketing executive, Kemi, who gets poached from the U.S. because a powerful Swedish company has had a huge uh, international scandal that was racially insensitive. And so on the flight, the, the CEO of the company Johan Yoni meets Brittany, who is a flight attendant who is tired of seven people and wants to be taken care of and then gets swept up into his world. And then there's mm. Muna, who is a refugee that left uh, Somalia that had to flee, lost her family en route, and is trying to create a new life for herself in Sweden. And the connection is she lands in an asylum center that was sponsored by Johan and then ends up as a janitor in his office. And so that's, so Johan, even though he's the link, I do not center Mm. him in their stories. The stories about the three women. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's incredible. You did it amazingly. Um, These are very, three very distinct black women, all with their own uh, storyline that they may be connected through this single person, but actually have no real connection with each other. Um, Their stories are very unique and individual. Um, What was it that made you want to write these three characters as opposed to, I know, three other different types of characters? Like, what was it about Kemi and Brittany Ray and Muna that you were like, I want to tell these stories? Absolutely, absolutely. And there's so many different and many more voices, right? That needs to yes. still be told. And these are just three of like thousands mm-hmm. in Sweden. But I knew, yeah. so before I found the women, I knew that it had to tackle three themes. So the theme of career, of class, and culture. So before I knew I was going to create Kemi, I knew I needed to create a career woman and talk about the difficulties and the microaggressions of what it is to try and thrive as mm. a Black woman in Sweden in Europe in general, because it's very different than in the US, you know? And I mean, even in Sweden, sometimes you don't even get called for a job interview if your name is not Nordic sounding. I mean, they're still at that level, right? And so I wanted to to bring a powerful woman into that mix. And then class, because it actually is, even though it's a very open society and I do love living here, it's still very classist. People ask you where you Mm. live, so they can quickly socioeconomically mm. place you. <laughs> you know, that's like that's the polite right. way of saying, oh, okay, you live in this neighborhood. So maybe it's quite classist. It's because it's very, uh, it's a tight, closed community. I call it the most yeah. open society run by the most private, closed people. It is that. Right. And then <laughs> it is, it, yeah. it really is. It's the most mm-hmm. open society run by the most private people. And then culture, because uh, Sweden has opened its doors to a lot of refugees, but there's a difference between assimilation and integration. And there's still a lot of integration issues because uh, Sweden wants you to assimilate. And when you tell somebody assimilate, you say, drop who you are, drop your identity, right. drop your uh, values to be like us. 
Whereas integration says, as long as you respect the values, you respect the rules, you can come as you are. We're going to make space for who you are. And so that's what's causing a lot of issues. And so I knew I needed to tackle this book from those three different angles. And that was how Kemi and and, uh, Brittany and Mona came to place. Now, the reason why Johan is in the book is because Black women do not move to Sweden without a reason. We do not move. I'm (laughs) I'm just, it's true. (laughs) It's a fact. You know, and I'm and I'm somebody that travels widely. It's not. It wouldn't be on my first. Exactly. Yeah, it wouldn't be on you my know, first. And I'm uh, you know, ten. I yeah. am confident in this generalization because I I don't like to generalize, uh-huh. but this one, I'm quite confident. It's not top. Yeah. The Nordics are not a top location for Black women. No. It's not Spain. Right. It's not Portugal. It's not France. It's not the right. UK. It's not places where we might think, oh, the culture. Let me let me go there. So I can f- I can sort you. of fit in it somehow, right? Yes. Exactly. So something mm-hmm. has to bring you as a black man to the Nordics. Number one reason is love. You meet somebody from mm. the region, you come. The second reason is actually as a refugee, you come, and then maybe a work transfer or you know study abroad program, mostly in Copenhagen. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know, but right. um, that is. Uh, and so that was why Johan's character was essential to be created. Otherwise, the book wouldn't have been rooted in in the reality. Reality that experienced. Yeah, yeah. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, there's so I'm being mindful also not to give any spoilers because there's yes. a lot in the book that um, <laughs> I just want people to be able to read. So please do join us yes. in the book club so we can read it together and talk about the spoilers together. Um, <laughs> But, you know, one of the things I don't I feel like this is not such a huge spoiler, but one of the things is, as we've mentioned, like these three characters don't really like it's not like they come together or have a lot of time together. Um, Why was that important um, for them? You know, because there are I'm guessing there are you know, as a black woman, you're not the majority. So there's going to be fewer of you. Like I, in in my mind, as I'm reading, I'm like, I want them to come together. I want them to yes. band together. I want them to be friends. <laughs> I want them to like get together and like destroy white supremacy exactly. together. Um, <laughs> yeah. That wasn't really the story that you wrote. No, no because that's in reality, yeah. that's not real, especially in the, in the Nordics mm. is... Um, yes, there are lots of communities. I have an amazing community of black women where I just feel safe. But there are also pockets of communities of Black women that don't really connect because our values are different, right? We're just different. And I know a lot of people wanted me to create this kind of Charlie's Angels, you know, banding of right. the three women. <laughs> but, but in reality, <laughs> and I am an idealist. That was That is how I move. You yes. know, I, I would do that. But yeah. Brittany and Mona, there's nothing that would have organically brought them together because Brittany is married to the 1% and Muna is right. a janitor and she who is also a jabby. You know, she wears the, the hijab and there, and there's such a class divide in the culture. Yes. You know, there's no way they would have organically um, connected. Plus uh, right. Brittany was, yeah. So there's no way. And then with Kemi, yeah. Kemi and, and Muna, that's, relationship was a bit more organic because of the work situation. Right. But Kemi and Brittany also wouldn't have been friends if they were somewhere else because Kemi yeah. is also a very problematic character. She's very judgy. Right. And so she, th- that, <laughs> you know, she that relationship, I think that yes. was <laughs> every time they interacted, I was like, Oh, was, Kemi, what are I you know, doing? It's <laughs> and, and it's because Kemi is somebody that feels like she has struggled all her life to get where she is and that Britney is just using her yeah. looks to get through to coast right. through life, you know, and, uh, right. and so so there's already that judgment, you know, coming from Kemi. So they wouldn't yeah. have been close friends, you know, in that sense. And so I wanted yes. to create something yeah. that just reflected reality because one thing I also find uh, that could be insulting to Black people is saying, "Oh, you know what? You're from Nigeria. I met this." one person from Nigeria, maybe your friends, are you right. from the same, do you right. know each other? Maybe you should be friends. Right. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. We have close to 300 million, you know, 
So, right. so I, yeah, so I wanted to give space again for the women to just be yeah. individuals, to just be, to just make mistakes, to not be perfect and, re- yes. and, uh, and reflect reality. So. Yeah, I think, I think it, I mean, that was one of the things I realized as I came to the end of the book was like, what she's written is actually much closer to what would happen in reality versus what the, um, you know, the idealist in me would yes. want it to be. Yes. Um, and that's something to sit with, you know, like this is what the reality is. Dear good ancestors, let's take a short break for a minute. Are you enjoying this episode? Then you should join our book club. The Become a Good Ancestor book club is a place for book-loving changemakers. We are a community of engaged people from around the world who are passionate about social justice, creativity, leadership, healing, liberation, and of course, books. Each month on Patreon, we read and discuss the book from the current month's episode. And at the end of the month, we host an exclusive Q&A event with the author themselves. Our past books and authors include the New York Times bestseller, The Prophets, by Robert Jones Jr., Motherhood, on the Choices of Being a Woman, by Dr. Praya Agrawal, The Final Revival of Opal and Nev, by Donnie Walton, named a best book of 2021 by Barack Obama, and See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love, by renowned civil rights leader, Valerie Carr. The internet can often be a loud and overwhelming place, There's a lot of information out there, but not always a lot of depth. When you join our book club, you'll become a member of a thoughtful and hopeful corner of the internet. To learn more, click the link in the show notes or visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club. We can't wait to see you there. Um, Lola, you talk a lot about, in the book, we cover a lot of themes that actually we talk about in Me and White Supremacy as well. So things such as exotification yes. and fetishization and white saviorism yes. and things like that. But what was really interesting about the way that you've covered it is that the reader is kind of left thinking like, is it a fetish or is it a preference? Yes. Is it like saviorism or is it them just trying to like do their best? Mm. And you don't really answer the question directly for yes. us. <laughs> um, you kind of leave us to sit with it. Yes. Um, how were you, Is was that something intentional that you were doing as you were writing the book? No, absolutely. I mean, the book covers a lot of things and, you know, they always say debut authors are quite ambitious in that they want to just tackle everything. But that is how life right. is, right? <laughs> life is messy. Life is multidimensional. At what point yeah. does tokenism become racism and then sexism becomes, yes. you know, it all blends into each yeah. other. And then, um, Johan's character is a symbolic character. I created him a specific way, you know, because I wanted him to also represent kind of the good meaning, quote unquote, blind, uh, the blindsided white savior that doesn't understand that other people have their own agency. You're not supposed to (laughs) save. And and in a sense, you know, as much as I love Sweden, I love living here. it, It kind of does that a lot where you see, Right. See all the refugees we've saved, you know, we're the defender of human rights. But then are you giving people a chance to actually have purpose and meaning in their lives? Mm. You know, mm. once they come here, do they feel welcome? Do they feel like they can integrate? Yeah. Do, or do they feel kind of excluded and isolated because they're not fully understood? So it's a very yeah. complex uh, thing because on the one hand, you want to do good, but at the at the other end, the goodness has to, it can't stop somewhere because just right. because it's being shown to the world, it actually has to continue and do the other work, which is now, you know, for yeah. Mona, it was easy for her to come in. That's the easy part now. Mm. How does Mona what, feel now like the she work can, starts. yeah, how can she self-actualize fully? And, and that's where the, that's where the difference is, so. Muna is a really um, interesting character, um, both because we often don't get to read stories about refugees and their experiences, but also she's she's younger than the other two characters. Yes. So she is 
she's dealing with the greatest amount of trauma, just in pure, like, thing, awful, terrible things that have happened to her. Um, but she's also young, right? And yes. so she's trying to understand really complicated things and trying to find who she is and really trying to understand, like, do these people want me here? Yeah. Who do I have to be in order to belong yeah. here? Um, talk a little bit about Muna and writing Muna's character. Because she, I feel like Kemi and Brittany are a little bit more similar, yes. whereas Muna was was quite distinct. Absolutely. And, and there's also a reason why I add all three stories side by side, is to also show that suffering isn't an Olympics. That even though yes. Muna suffers more than Brittany, Brittany's struggles are also valid in our own yes. world, right? And yes. and so with Muna, Muna was the character that's closest to me. Because most people always mm. think that Kemi, Kemi is the character The career that's woman. Me. Yes. Because right. even though, you know, I'm a career woman, but and Kemi is Nigerian-American who moved and la, la, la. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, Kem, Kemi is just me being lazy as an author because it's easy to <laughs> write her, right? But Muna's right. character, Muna's character is... Uh, is actually closer to me as a person because Muna represented my 15-year-old self when I moved uh, from mm. Nigeria to the U.S. And even though it wasn't as a refugee, we, you know, I, I can't even begin to imagine the trauma she faced. Um, right. But I was right. able to pull from a lot of that feeling of isolation and exclusion and feeling like an outsider and not finding yes. your place or, or your voice, you know, and trying to... Yeah. Um, so that was kind of what influenced uh, Muna's character, you know. And so she's the mm. character that I wanted to also show how important community is. Because once you find yes. a community, once you find a space where you don't feel like you have to explain your existence, then you can keep, yeah. you know, just moving and growing and living. So, Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you you shared that this book is about culture. A lot of your work is influenced by culture. You wrote the Swedish book on culture. Um, yes. <laughs> I was struck by, yeah, so I was struck by how, as I was reading it, I was like, um, and I've not been to Sweden, so I don't know what the culture is like there. So this was my first time reading a book set there. I feel like that's probably the case for a lot of people, but also it's the first time reading a book set in Sweden through the perspective of Black characters and their experiences of being in this space. And so it felt like this this, this space was like both an Eden, but also a prison. Yes. Right? Like it was like this wonderful idealistic place, but it was also very like um, suffocating and um, lonely, yes. actually. I think that that's the word that comes through. Really, really lonely. Um, I'd love, and I don't, I, I want to say this. I don't, I know the book is set in Sweden. You're based in Sweden, mm -hmm. but I don't think that this experience of feeling both accepted and not accepted is limited to Sweden, Correct. right? White Correct. supremacy shows up differently in countries, white majority countries around the world. But what has been your experience of living there and what things did you want to bring into the book to be able to share with us? Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's everything you said about that being very open, but yet feeling very uh, isolated because um, yes. each time I travel, I keep getting met with the one dimensional image of Sweden. Where it's just yes. everything is perfect, you know, it's blondes, Volvos, Mikos, it's Ikea. everything is perfect. <laughs> it's Ikea. And all right. those are amazing yeah. things about Sweden too. But I'm also a black yes. woman in Sweden. And Sweden also has yeah. like 25% of the culture of people have, you know, roots somewhere else. But we don't see that globally, right? And so to kind of offset all the press I give Sweden as a travel writer. <laughs> I mean, I've written a mm -hmm. lot about the country and I still do because I love it. But I'm also a black woman here. I battle microaggressions daily. You know, it's not as easy for me to fully self-actualize than if I was living in the U.S. You know, it's it's easier for mm. me to actually self-actualize as a black woman there. But I'm but I but it's hard work. And so what I wanted to yeah. do was paint a more complete picture 
because yeah. one of the things that Europe Europeans like to say is that we don't see color and bad things happen yes. somewhere else. <laughs> and we're right. like, really? Really? You know, and so this book is to show that, you know what? And that's what you said, you know, and I love that you said that this could happen anywhere else, anywhere else. It's not just limited to Sweden. Exactly. That's the point to also show Sweden that this also happens here as well. So you cannot say that this doesn't happen here, you know, and, and that's one of the right. things with, you know, in Europe, it's like things don't happen here. And one of the issues is really, it boils down to acknowledgement, right? So when you say you do not see color, then that means you're not acknowledging what makes me different and my different yes. needs. It's yes. a lack of acknowledgement. It's saying if I don't see your color, then you mean then I don't fully acknowledge what you bring that's different to the table. To the table. Right. To the table. So that so it's very the book is very layered, you know, and uh, mm. and two things can exist. I always say that the US, we all know it's kind of rife with racial tensions. But there's also Yosemite yeah. National Park. It's beautiful. <laughs> like Right. Two things can exist, you know, and I think yes. the problem we see in Europe is just it tries to push the one dimensional image and not fully accept mm. that things are not perfect. You know, that's what right. makes us vulnerable when we actually say, you know what, I am fantastic at, at all these things, but I could also learn. You know, I don't know everything. And isn't that what connects? Isn't that what creates connection, human connection, when we show each other our our humanity and our vulnerability, you know, vulnerabilities, right? <laughs> to show us that, you know, we're uh-huh. not perfect as well. That's what, uh, that's what connects people. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex book. And, uh, and it is, been, uh, and it, but it's, yeah. what, <laughs> I was going to, what I was going to say is it's a complex book in the, in the sense that there are three different stories. Um, and like you said, you're tackling a number of different issues, but what I really appreciated though, is that it's written in clear language. So it's very accessible. Um, it never felt like I don't, I don't know how to read this book. Uh, it, it was very easy to follow the three different storylines and it was, it was, it's well written. And I, I think it's actually often harder to write simply yes. um, <laughs> because you stop trying to like impress people. Right. Yes. And it's yes. just like, let me just tell the damn story. Yeah, no, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and it was actually by yeah. choice, by design, because, you know, I, mm. I, I do write, you know, I've written for many publications. I've got other books and those books feel more like literary fiction, especially my book before Log Up, which is about my travels. It's very visual right. and visceral. And, but with this book, I was like, this book has a story to tell and I do not want to cushion the story with flowery prose because at the end of the day, people that need to read the book are going to remember my prose and say, oh, she could turn a phrase instead of remembering the lives of the women, which is the important thing. And so it was actually by choice because I started writing the book as literary, uh, literary fiction and then I stopped. And said, no, 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 no. This needs to be written in really tight, sharp prose so that you remember the women. And and somebody recently said, I thought this was, (laughs) somebody recently said this, you know, um, where we call them African aunties that always throw shade at you. So they they are Mm -hmm. unfiltered, you know, and they they don't care about your feelings (laughs) and they just tell you. Yes. So somebody said that they felt like this book was like an African auntie that didn't care about your yeah. feelings and just kept <laughs> disappointing you every, yes. you know, every time. Like, I don't care. I just face it, you know? Yes. <laughs> and I thought that was quite true. It's like, because those Af- African aunties, you're not sure if they are complimenting you or reprimanding you, but yeah. they're just direct and they don't care if you Do you cry. know what, Lola? The- this is this is how I felt. So I got I got to the last page and I I literally just wanted to throw the book away. I was like, Lola, exactly. damn it, I want to fight you. I want to fight you. Yes. And then I was yes. like, thank God you included a reading guide and then you included a section called Conversation with the Author. And I'm mm-hmm. so glad 
that you included that because I needed some closure. Because I was like, I need to speak to Lola. Like, I need to understand (laughs) why she just did this to me. Um, Was that, did you know up front that you needed to include something at the end for your readers? Yeah, I I, I did know I needed to share more context because sometimes when people go into the reading experience, they may not know what I as the author bring to to that. So for example... Muna and Ahmed, I'm not giving anything away, but I spent two years at, a, at an asylum center working on a photography project with asylees in Sweden. You know, I will go, I will mm. set up a studio, just take some really nice fun shots of them against the blue background and then came back and printed it out. So they actually add, you know, even though it was, you know, they could take it digitally, but so they add something to old to see themselves. Yeah. And I did that for two years and I spent time talking to a lot of people, you know, from, from Syria, Afghanistan, everywhere, and, and, and met characters that inspired some of the characters in the book, like Ahmed, right? I met a, a Kurdish guy that inspired Ahmed and some of the things he said was said to me, you know, and yeah. meeting people like Munar as well. And so um, I needed to create that context you know, I talked about a, a Swedish quote I came across called uh, the deepest well can also be drained. And that yes. quote, I needed to give that quote justice because black women are the deepest wells in society. We we are, we pull right. and pull and pull uh, from endless resources of strength, but we're also human. Yes. And we need to be taken right. care of mentally, emotionally, physically. So, mm. so I needed to write that conversation with an author to give more clarity on why I wrote the book the way I did. Yeah, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did, and you allowed you kind of allowed me as the reader to like really throw the questions back to me on like why I needed to have like neat answers and complete closure and, you know, all of that. And instead you invite the reader to sit with the questions um, because, and that's life, right? Because that's life. So I think you did a, I think you did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Thank you. you. I want to introduce, I want to bring somebody on now, um, our wonderful Brand new book club facilitator in the Good Ancestor, in the Become a Good Ancestor book club, Rima Zaman. Um, So Rima, if you can turn your camera on. Hi. Yes. Hi, Rima. Hello, hello. Lola, I love your book so much. Thank you. It's such an honor and pleasure. I want to I want to give a quick introduction to Rima. Some of you may recognize her. She was actually on the podcast when it was called Good Ancestor Podcast and we got to have a wonderful conversation about her memoir I Am Yours. Um I have loved Rima ever since and was delighted when she joined our team as our book club facilitator and she has been leading book club discussions on Patreon for our members and leading our fireside chat with our author and is just such a um she's just such a joy to know and i'm i'm so glad to know her personally and i'm so glad that she is part of team good ancestor um so thank you and welcome rima and rima's here in her capacity as book club facilitator to ask some book club type questions to our author mm-hmm. um and to get everyone excited to join the book club and to join the discussion so i'll hand over to you now rima Thank you so much, Leila. It is such an honor and pleasure to be here and to be part of our amazing community. And it's such an honor and pleasure to be speaking to you, Lola. I've just been <laughs> enamored with everything you two have been discussing, and I have copious notes <laughs> for what I want to bring to our book club during June, your month. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I feel like you already did an excellent job at answering the questions I had prepared. So that's great. We're going to go even deeper now. And um, initially the, I, yeah, I had two questions for you and they were about more like the literary journey you went through as a writer Mm -hmm. um, when crafting this really richly fabriced book. Um, The three distinct women are so distinct. And as a fiction author as well, I know, how difficult that is. And you make it look seamless, which also means there was so much work happening in the background. And you already mentioned that initially you started writing it as literary fiction, and then you stopped and you said, I'm going to 
let the flowery prose get out of the way so these women can just speak in the most straightforward manner. And so similarly, did you go through any kind of transformation or exercise to really identify, develop, and hone in on the three distinct women? Absolutely, absolutely. Was that difficult to come into or how many drafts? What did you no. do? What kind of <laughs> no, absolutely. And thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. That's a great question. I spent the first four to five months before actually writing the book, working on the characters. So I was just outlining, identifying, saying, okay, these are the people I would like. This is what she feels like. This is what she would do. This is what she will say. So that by the time I actually started writing the very first dirty draft, that just took four months. And the char- I had known the characters so well by that time that when I put them in a situation, the characters just write themselves. So because you know them, they're like people to me now mm. that I know if I put Kemi yeah. in this situation, this is how she'll react and this is what she'll say. If I put Mona in this situation, this is what she'll do and react. So I spent four to five months just on the character building on figuring out places and personalities and quirks and things that I wanted to bring into their worlds before actually writing at the book. I love it. <laughs> and I love also how you brought in little pieces of yourself, yes. like Lagom yes. in the in the Swedish yes. class. Yes. And then you're not too little, not too much, just right. Yes. And I'm from Bangladesh originally, and we have a similar word and a similar, I guess, mantra or mindset, which is andaje, mm. which means the same thing, not too little, not too much, just right. Just right. <laughs> yes. And so I love mm. that you also placed pieces of yourself into the different women's worlds. Yes if not directly into their personalities, then, but into the fabric of their world. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and one thing I didn't want to say, and, and I'm without giving anything away, I mean, I sprinkled a lot of myself and my experiences mm-hmm. into a lot of the women's lives from some of the places they lived to a specific flight that I fly route I take yeah. all the time. To cl- so it's to a specific club, you know, music club, like all of those things are kind of within my circle, within my experiences, even though none of the experiences mirror mine yeah. in that way, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, I was able to sprinkle a lot of my, uh, you know, things I love, things I, I don't like things, you know, just sprinkle mm-hmm. them across all the characters. I love it. That's why it feels so grounded and authentic because these are, you know, technically fictional women, but they're grounded in reality. Yes. Um, And especially, I think their choices made so much sense to me, even the choices where I could see the foreshadow of what may happen. (laughs) I I also understood I had empathy for every single one of the choices. So thank you for that. You, you, you say that it's not literary fiction, maybe perhaps in the stylistic manner, but it's definitely, it's got the depth and gravitas of literary fiction. So I applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, (laughs) Yeah, I have another question about the complexity, actually. of um, You mentioned how one of the things you say is that two things can exist. And I, I say something similar, which is two things can exist. As, two truths can be true at once. Yes. And I loved that you found those contradictions and dichotomies in each one of these complex characters. And the character I identify and empathize with most deeply is Brittany. Um, And I also found myself really understanding and identifying with the the layered toxicity of that relationship she has with Mm. Yoko. And I think you did a masterful job with, he could have become a two-dimensional trope, you know, and just a white savior that we loathe. But I really appreciate that even though, of course, you don't center him, you center the three women. I also found myself empathizing with his needs and choices, even the ones that I found egregious, (laughs) which again is, is because you're a masterful writer and storyteller. Thank you. And um, so my, yeah, my, my question is, and I have a hundred, but I'm limiting it to two specific ones. (laughs) My second question is which character came most easily to you and which was the most difficult Mm. Or or who did you struggle with most? Britney was the most difficult. Yeah. Britney was the most difficult character for me to, to create because, um, as a person, Britney and I don't have the same values or very similar values, but 
Britney is valid and and she's allowed yeah. to exist without ex- explanation and she's allowed to want what she wants. I mean, this is a woman that has been serving others for over 20 years. She's tired of serving. She wants to be taken care of. Plus, she never dealt with a, with a trauma from her past. And while it's very mm-hmm. difficult for us to deal with traumas, it can be very it can, the patterns can repeat themselves. Right. And I'll stop there without giving anything. So, yeah. uh, Brittany was a difficult character to create. Kemi was, was me being lazy. And as I mentioned, it's because, you know, I'm a career woman, I'm Nigerian American. I can root her in those things quickly because I experienced a lot of it. I can even look at myself and say, how can I describe Kemi, okay, sure. <laughs> she looks Kemi, this way. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, Kemi. So I just say that. So uh uh, but um Muna, I think, even though um, you know, Muna is most Muslim, I am I'm Christian and I don't have a lot of deep, deep connection within the Somali community. I wanted to create that connection with Muna. I think she was the easiest character for me to write as a person because I was writing her without her being defined by anything else, by her community, you know, by her religion, by what she's supposed to do. I just wrote her as just an innocent, naive, you know, child trying to find a place in the world, you know? And so I think Muna Mm -hmm. was the one that was easy. Ah, easier to to write from from yeah. that feeling uh, from that feeling because I felt a lot of that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, with Johan, I didn't want to just create uh, a stereotypical white guy that's just you know entitled and which in many ways he is. But I wanted to cr- make him more nuanced and complex because mm-hmm. life is not just black and white where it's just white guy bad. You know, we black women right. good. You know, it's not that. He is a very complex character, and and by design, I wanted to also normalize some things about him as well, yeah. but also show what unchecked privilege can be like as well. So I wanted to create yeah. really super complex characters because that is what life is. Life is not just black and white and, and clear cut that way. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, you did an incredible thank job. You. So thank you. Thank yeah. You. you know what what's really just struck me actually about Johan as you as you're talking about this is a lot of the like family dynamics he had going on mirror a lot of the family dynamics you might see in an African family or an Asian family of like yes. expectations mm. and like how you know what will other people think and that kind of yes. thing and so I don't know if that was intentional but that's just I've just realized that as as yeah. you were talking yeah we're all more similar yeah. like and that's the point because I spend a lot of time really deep diving in cultures when I travel and in my work I'm trying to show a lot just how similar we are even though we think we're so different you know we want the same things we're affected by many of the same things I mean like you said the family dynamics there and what will neighbors think you know what will I mean it's it happens in different cultures and so I wanted to write a book that was real and I don't know if you know this or if you know anything about the publication journey for this book, but it was a struggle to get this book published. We had over mm. over 70 rejections. Nobody wanted to touch this book. Ooh. Nobody wanted to touch this book. Wow. Because it's so audacious and it's so because brave it is audacious. straightforward. Nobody wanted yeah. to. They said, who is the audience? We're not sure. Um, we, we still don't have a Swedish publisher. Because most of the Swedish publishers also rejected the book. They said, uh, the biggest one said, um, if you can cut out section sections of Mona's <laughs> story and tone down your voice, wow. then we can publish it because wow. we're worried about the Swedish audience. We think they might not wow. be able to handle it. And I, of course yeah. I said no. Which is... <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, which just pro- proves your point. Exactly, right. exactly. So, so, so right. the book is just pretty much proving its point the longer we go without a Swedish publisher, right? So mm-hmm. so that's just, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's been an incredible journey to get this book to publication, but it also is what I tell people to stick with your truth, with your voice, stick with your, yes. you know, and and don't uh, back down. 
because the world will yes. want you to dilute your voice, to dilute your story, to dilute your truth so that it's more palatable for others and, and don't do that. And I'm really grateful I didn't do that. Thank you for sharing that with us, Lola. This is, I mean, this comes to the very heart of our mission with the podcast and, and the book club and, you know, what we believe about supporting BIPOC authors and authors of color and making sure that every type of story that they want to tell, right? Like yes. a, any, yes. <laughs> any, like we should not only have to write about, you know, certain things in order for it to be exactly. seen as valid, which is, exactly. I guess, goes to the root of what you're saying in, in, in every mirror, mar- she's black. So thank you for sticking with it and for, um, for, for being committed and true to your voice and, and allowing this book to finally come out into the world. It must feel so sweet and so good to finally have it yes, no, <laughs> to finally have it out yeah no absolutely but also sweet that I didn't have to compromise a lot to get it out yes like I would you know yes. that I stuck through it so that it came out the way it was supposed to come out with the original intention the voice mm-hmm. and and so that is what I'm grateful for because that's what is really resonating and getting people to feel you know, and getting people to also yeah. check their own prejudices as well. So, so I'm grateful yes. for the journey of this book. It means you've created a book that is a piece of your legacy mm. as opposed to the silencing of your voice. Yes. Yes. And mm-hmm. you're honoring your ancestors in this. You're carrying out their work and vision of you. Thank you. Thank you. When you frame it that way, it's really humbling and just soul staring. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. That's actually a pers- perfect place to close. Um, so I'm going to ask you our very last question, Lola. What does becoming a good ancestor mean to you? Mm. And I think that was just Rima kind of summed it up, <laughs> right, for me is, yes. uh, is, is showing up as fully as I can to show mm-hmm. that the sky is big enough for all birds to fly and that me showing up as something else is kind of rubbing the, my, the future generation of, of inspiration, of, of uh, kind of a role model of being, living outside boxes, you know? So for me, being a good ancestor is really to fully show up as myself and live my truth to inspire others to do the same, to say that, you know what, society cannot box me in, that I am going to be the mm-hmm. one to create the limits on myself but I will always show up and fight any kind of limitations or or upper ceilings or boxes or pre-crafted narratives that society tries to do on my behalf. So just really fully showing up as myself. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rima. And thank you, Lola, for this incredible conversation. Oh, thank you so much for having me. The honor is mine. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Layla. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed learning about today's author and their incredible work. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us some love with a rating and review. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And of course, don't forget to buy the book we talked about today. We're on a mission to center and celebrate BIPOC authors, and you can help us do that by sharing this episode and the book. You can join us in our book club to dive deeper into today's book. Visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club to find out more. For more inspiration and learning, you can find us at becomeagoodancestor.com and become underscore a underscore good underscore ancestor on Instagram. Thank you for being on the journey with us as we strive to become good ancestors. In honor of those who have come before us, and in service to those who will come after we are gone.